Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Bethlehem United Methodist Church. We especially welcome any guests that we have with us today. If you are here for the first time, we have a gift for you at our Welcome Center in the Narthex, which is located behind me, uh, here behind the double doors. Please look for our greeters by the main doors directly behind me after the service, and they will be glad to answer any questions that you may have and give you a tour of the church if you would like, although I recommend that you eat first and then get the tour. <laughs> Welcome to Bethlehem, and we hope you come again. Now, if you are a regular visitor to Bethlehem, we would love to have you join our fellowship. Just let Pastor Lord know if you would like to become a member of our congregation. We ask you to please sign the attendance folders found at the end of the pew and pass it to the person next to you. We would also like you to write down any changes to your address, phone number, or email. This is important to help us keep our church rosters current and to stay in touch with our visitors. Once the folder gets to the end of the pew, if you will please pass it back and notice if you have any visitors on your pew and welcome them. Please make sure the pew pad includes today's date. Large print bulletins are available from the ushers, as well as bulletins for children. Please raise your hand if you would like to have either one of these. I encourage you to refer to your bulletin for the announcements, and I would like to highlight a couple of them at this time. The filled Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes are due today. There will be no extensions. Or maybe not. See me after class. <laughs> a planning meeting for the mission trip to Guatemala in February 2015 is scheduled for Monday afternoon, November the 10th at 3 p.m. for anyone interested in more information or to sign up for the trip. And is this you, wife? Ah. Okay, my lovely wife has an announcement. I have two great Bible verses for you. Before anything was created, he was there. Before everything together, he all holds everything together. Do not be conformed by the facts of this world, but be transformed by them. We are so excited that Friday night is the drunk truck or for church. I'm very nervous. <laughs> but this is my costume. I am a thing of this on Friday night, come and see what I will be. <laughs> we need volunteers. We have about six signed up right now. We need about 12. Come in costume, however you like. Biblical Bible verses are optional. If you need ideas, just ask a young mom, me, or Megan, and we'll help you find something. We'd love to see you. I'm a little curious as to what the transformation will be as well. <laughs> um, also, uh, I will let you know that um, Paul Eland has made it back after his journey, and we're so glad to see him today. And, uh, and if you didn't know, today is his birthday, and he informed Wyatt that he is 109 years old. <laughs> And so apparently on the Appalachian Trail, he also found the Fountain of Youth. So I encourage you to take some time, talk to him, and <laughs> know why it's seven. And now, let us stand for the choral call to worship as found in our bulletin. me in the opening prayer, which is the prayer of St. Francis. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. 
Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. I invite you to pass the peace. Please greet your neighbors, welcome them. The peace of the Lord be with you. stanza. In Christ your hand you then shall know, shall fill your sins for him. Baptists will pay your and hope that love is found. Please turn to 738 in your hymnal for our Psalter. It's Psalm 1. We'll read responsibly page 738, Psalm 1. Blessed are those who do not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on God's law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water that yield their fruit in season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. seated and I'd like to invite the children to come up for our children's time.
Good morning, everyone. Let's say there's something that you... Maybe that's good right there. I think it is. Okay. Thank you, Robbie. I appreciate that. Should have tested that ahead of time, shouldn't we? Let's say there's something that you really want. You've been wanting it for a while, and it might be a toy or a game or something to do, something big, like maybe going to Disney World or something, maybe a pony even, something that you would really like to have. And you're, one day your parents came up. And they said to you, you know, we love you so much. We want to give you what you've been wanting. And whatever it is. For me, it was a mini bike when I was young. But for you, it might be a game. It might be a toy. It I might be that trick. You got a new game, didn't you? Yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> and they give it to you. And you're just so happy. And they say, we just love you so much. We want you to have this gift because we love you. There it is. Whatever it is you wanted, it's right there. They're, they're giving it to you. It's the gift to you. Now, what would you do to tell your mom and dad or show your mom and dad that you're thankful for what they've just given you? What would you do? Is there something you would say to them or something you would do? To show Tell them thank you. What else? What's something you might show them? Hug them. Go give them a big hug and say thank you. Maybe a kiss. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe there's something that you would want to do for them just to show them that you love them, that you would... You would do the things that they want you to do. You would want to make them happy by things you would do just to say thank you for their wonderful love and the gift that they've given you. The reason I'm saying all this is because God has given us the greatest gift of all, Jesus Christ. And it's a way of saying to us how much he loves us. And so the way we can say to God, thank you, is that we can do the things that pleases God. We can say to God, God, we love you back. We want to be obedient to you and do what you want us to do, caring for others and sharing your love because you love us first. And you give us all the wonderful things of life, and particularly Jesus Christ. So let's have a prayer together and let's thank God. Thank you, God, for the gift of your love through Christ our Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for your life for us that brings us life. I thank you for these boys and girls, and I ask God your blessings upon them. Give them a great day, a great week. Let them know how much you love them, and we love them too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming up, guys. If you want to head to Kids Corner, you can go with Mr. Dave and with Mia, and have a great day. See you later. Some days are just more challenging than other days. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But fun all the same. Fun all the same. Thank you. Uh, welcome to all of you. It's so great to see folks from the 8.30 service and 11.30 service. We're all together today. Today is our celebration Sunday. And as uh, Matt alluded to, that we do have a, a, a catered meal. It's John Perry's famous brisket and barbecue and all the fixing slaw. And our folks have been working in the kitchen and it's all prepared for you. You say, well, I wasn't prepared to stay. Please stay. We have plenty of food for all of you. And uh, be our guest. If you're here today as a guest, you be our guest today. And it's back in the fellowship hall. Before the service is over, we'll have our, our benediction and blessing over the food so that when you get there, you can just go ahead and go through the line and eat and sit and fellowship around the tables and just enjoy the day. Today is the culmination of our Committed to Christ Six Steps to Discipleship. And Paul Evelyn, uh, other than completing the 2,168 miles uh, this week of the Appalachian Trail, started out in Virginia and Virginia to Maine and then Georgia to Virginia. 
and, and finished on Wednesday. Uh, Paul is also um, our stewardship chair, and I've asked Paul to come and just share a word. So, Paul, we welcome you home, and uh, thank you for all the that you do. So, Paul, come share with us. Celebration Sunday. It's uh, good to see everybody here and join in a celebration all together. But I'm celebrating for a couple reasons that you're probably not celebrating. And one specifically is that I finished the Appalachian Trail hike as of this last Tuesday, arriving home late Wednesday night. Uh, and I went back to Damascus and finished in Georgia instead of uh, the original intention. Oh, I got okay. Uh, Secondly, I'm celebrating because I'm alive to talk about it. <laughs> and third, I'm celebrating because yet today is my uh, 68th birthday and not my 109th, as I so alluded to earlier. <laughs> it just feels like 109. <laughs> uh, but that's not why we're all here. We're all here to celebrate something much more important, and there's three reasons why we're celebrating. And that's our Christianity. We're celebrating our commitment to improving our, our discipleship of Christ in the coming year. And we're celebrating our financial commitment to Bethlehem for the calendar year 2015 as well. You know, the fall program just ended, and I'm sorry I wasn't here for that. It, it took me about a month longer than I anticipated due to some side events that we had to attend to along the way. But as you discovered through this, the six steps of discipleship, that it all started with prayer. And we know you can't have a relationship with God unless it starts with prayer. But I hope when we start our prayer, we're first giving thanks for everything that he's bestowed upon us. Uh, because we are so blessed here in the United States, at SML, in this church. Uh, and I hope you're counting your blessings before you pray for something and ask for it. But if you ask for anything, please ask for a royal victory tonight. <laughs> The second thing is, is Bible reading, and is, as you discovered, the, the best way to have any kind of one-on-one -on -one relationship with God is, is through reading the Bible. You know, as, you, as you're reading the Bible, you're also listening to the Word of God, and, and what a wonderful blueprint on how to live your life. When it comes to worship attendance, I love the one service Sundays and seeing a, a sanctuary full of people. Just how great would it be if we had sanctuary full of people for both services. And how great would it be if you all had just come from the Christian education hour? And how wonderful it would be if we all showed up on Wednesday night for Wonderful Wednesday. We might run out of food the first night, but I promise you we wouldn't run out of food twice in a row. Uh, so if you haven't uh, participated in either one of those two events for a while, uh, give it another shot. I think you'll really enjoy it. When it comes to witnessing, uh, that's a tough nut uh, for a lot of people, and some people shy away from that. The best way to witness is through our actions. I know I had several opportunities on the trail to witness, and I took advantage of those with people I was comfortable with. Sometimes when I wasn't so comfortable, I'm ashamed to say I shied away from the opportunity. Uh, and I regret that. I got back home Wednesday night, and Susie was still up north with her kids, so I had some time to uh, do housework, homework, paperwork, and catch up on my movies. And the first movie I wanted to see was Left Behind. The only place I could see that was in uh, Lynchburg, but it was, deals with the uh, second coming. And it centers around the fact that uh, the second coming came, Christians from around the, the world descended into heaven in the blink of an eye. And the non-believers and the hypocrites were the ones that were left behind and had to deal with what was left and the emotions. And the focus of the movie dealt with a, a young co-ed and her dad that were both non-believers. And the, the mother always tried to uh, talk to him about religion, talk to him about the life of her after and about Christ. And they refused to listen and actually got to find and belligerent about it. And the movie kind of ends with them understanding that, yeah, mom was right. But 
point is, we probably all have people in our lives that uh, still maybe not believe in earnest. And don't give up on them. Keep witnessing. When it comes to giving, and that's what really we're here today to uh, give blessings and, and thanks and celebrate our commitment to Bethlehem for the calendar year 2015. And if you haven't had a chance to fill out your card yet, there's extra cards in the pew. I know there's cards out in the hall. Uh, it's important to the church to understand the budgetary needs where we're at so we can use the offerings to the most efficient way possible to spread the word. But I hope you're also counting your blessings because truly being in the, living in the United States in today's world is a blessing. And I'm not sure I would want to live anywhere else right now than SML. And I'm not sure I'd want to be anywhere else on Sunday morning than right here at Bethlehem. We got a lot to be thankful for. There's an old joke and a bad joke about the man that was trying to figure out what to give the church. So he goes to the top of the mountain, he throws all his money up in the air and says, Lord, take what you want, give the rest back to me. You know, we have a responsibility as Christians to share our blessings with those less fortunate. And unfortunately, we have quite a few less fortunate right here in our own backyard. There's no better place to share our offerings than at the church, actually. That's the, the center of hope for a lot of people and the focus of hope. In the blink of an eye, he's coming. Are we hoarding our blessings or are we sharing them? In the blink of an eye, I'm not sure we'll get a second chance. You know, I, well, the last uh, thing is on service. And I know uh, this goes out kudos to all of you because whether you're sitting in the choir, ushering folks down or counting in the back or facilitating a Christmas, uh, Christmas education hour or showing up on Wednesday and, and running a class or helping out in the kitchen or just sitting in the pews. Everybody has a role, everybody has a part, and everybody's participating, and that's why we're all celebrating today because it doesn't do any good to facilitate a class and nobody's in the, in the, in the seat. The last time I was here, I talked to you about there's no reward without effort. You certainly find that out on the trail. Uh, the reward's being on top of the hill, but it takes a lot of effort to get there. You know, it takes a lot of effort to be a Christian, too. Christ told his disciples to drop everything and follow him. As disciples of Christ, what are we willing to do? You know, we're seeking the greatest reward that Christ has to offer in life everlasting. God's going to let us just coast until the judgment day. I think we need to keep ourselves spiritually fit until that day comes. That means working on your discipleship every year, year on year, always improving. It allow you to hit the ground running once you get there, although I'm not sure we need to run it since we have eternity to get to where we're going. The last thing I want to talk about and leave you with is simplicity. Nothing gets simpler in the way of a lifestyle than on the Appalachian Trail. Trust me on that one. Uh, you do the same things day in and day out. And, uh, that's your survival mode. I ran across a uh, old homestead just off the Appalachian Trail in the Appalachians that uh, was being preserved. Forefathers of forefathers in the way they used to live. Everything by hand, eking out a living in, in the hard land. I did not write down the inscription. I actually included it in my blog this week, but I didn't write down the inscription either, so I'm going by memory. But it said something like this. As we progress in life, one should never forget where they came from. You know, take for granted the beauty and even grace that comes from a life of simplicity. We have so much coming back home Wednesday night, I just started counting my blessings, and it was amazing how many more blessings I had than when I started. This is a pillowcase. Pillow. 
on a bed and on a mattress inside four walls, butter in the refrigerator, a refrigerator, running water, toilet paper. You know, there's so many times on the trail, I literally lived three to four days, 24 seven in the same clothes. You eat as light as you possibly could, because uh, you had to carry the food, ramen noodles, mac and cheese, bowl of rice, cut up a Slim Jim for meat. Uh, do that day in and day out. Sleep on the hard ground, wet or dry, a little thin pad and makeshift pillow. And you get home and you realize you have all the comforts in the world sitting right in front of you, more than you possibly need. Are we sharing those comforts? Are we sharing our blessings or are we holding them? I don't want to be a downer on this because this is Celebration Sunday. But as we walk into the fellowship hall and we enjoy a wonderful meal and hopefully some chocolate cake, <laughs> think about what we're there for. We're celebrating our Christianity and the responsibilities that go with that distinction. God bless. I do want you to, to see the cake. It, it, have you seen it yet? Yeah. See the cake. It's uh, it's cool, and it is chocolate. So, <laughs> so there's a cake just for Paul. But uh, don't eat any of it yet. Just look at it first because it's it's really cool. If you did not receive one of the commitment cards in the mail, and some of you did not, we somehow um, there is one in the pew pad, and Stan standing up has. Uh, some in his hand and Tom too. Do you need one? It looks like Lynn Barnes right down here, Tom. Others need one? Raise your hand. Alright. At the end is it in your pew pad? Tom? Uh, up here. Mike Federo. Okay. Um, these can be filled out and put in the offering plate at the close of the service. Uh, we'll gather them in a basket and we're going to have a, uh, a celebration prayer, thanking God. Uh, as Paul says, we have so much. And this, uh, this whole program, uh, Paul found and we've uh, tweaked and made it our own. And uh, so I want to thank Paul Evelyn uh, for leading our stewardship committee and we have a wonderful group doing that work and so uh, this this past six weeks uh, has been uh, Paul's idea and it, it has had integrity to it and it's really been a joy to preach the different um, topics um, from prayer all the way up to service so um, it is a true celebration today uh, as we move towards our time of, of prayer a couple of notices we, and do call attention to the prayer list, folks that are serving in the military, there are other needs of our nation and our world. The note in the about Doug Overman uh, being his remains being interred at Arlington National Cemetery this week. May is already up there. Be in prayer for May. Uh, Mike Bond is at the VA hospital and uh, will be there uh, some of this week. We have a group of men that are heading down to Camp Hat Creek to build a cabin. They're uh, investing money in doing this, and this is for um, um, Patrick Henry Boys Home. They use this camp, and there's a real need there. So the group of men, uh, starting from Tuesday all the way to, to Friday, are going to um, be building a cabin. So be in prayer for that group. I'd like to give you just an update on, on my health. I, there's a number of you have been encouraging me to get a second opinion. Uh, and so I do have an appointment at UVA on November 14th with a, a top-notch uh, doctor there. So uh, thank you for your encouragement to do that, and we appreciate uh, your prayer as well. As we move towards our prayer time, let me invite you to sing. Uh, it's number 186 in the hymnal, uh, but it's Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. Let this be our call to prayer as we sing Alleluia. <coughs>
say alleluia. We praise your name. And we thank you, God, for this time of worship where we can gather with our brothers and sisters in Christ in this place of prayer to set aside the cares of the world, to put aside the things that we're worried about and thinking about, and to simply come into your presence to worship you, to praise you. And we pray that this time of worship will bring you joy. We love you. We thank you for all we have in life, and we have so much. You have blessed us in so many ways. Thank you for our nation. Thank you for our community. Thank you for our church and our friends in Christ who love us, who pray for us, who care for us. And I thank you, God, for being with those who are in need today. You are helping them. You're encouraging them. You're bringing about healing and hope and help for things in their lives that are, are needed, physical ailments, treatment for cancer and other serious disease recovery of um, a surgery and healing from that and those that are facing that in, in the days ahead. And we thank you, God, that you're with us always. We pray for our world and our world leaders. We pray for peace in places where there's strife and war and fighting and suffering and violence. We pray for people who are grieving, those who are sensing loss comfort them and bring them hope. Thank you, God, for each other. And we pray for the person sitting beside us now. We lift up those around us and we ask, God, that you meet their need. We're all people of need. We need you. We need your help. We need your strength. We need your spirit to live in and through us so that we can make a difference in the world around us so that we can leave this place ready to shine the light of Christ into those dark places. Thank you that they pray for us. We want to be a, a praying church, a caring church, a serving church, a giving church. Thank you. May this time again be a time with you. And we'll give you all the praise. We ask this in the strong name of Jesus who taught us when we pray to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Let us now worship as we present to God our tithes and our offerings. And again, if you have your, your card, you can put that in the offering plate as well.
thank you, God, for all that we have in life, and we have so much. So bless now these gifts that we return to you. Multiply them and use them for the glory of your kingdom. We pray in your name. Amen. Our hymn is 453, More Love to Thee, O Christ, 453. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the 22nd chapter of Matthew, verses 34 through 40. This is printed on the back of the bulletin. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher. Which commandment in the law is the greatest? And he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and all the prophets. The word of God. Thanks be
wonderful to have our full choir today. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Robbie. Let's pray. We want to be faithful to you. We want to be the Christians that you call us to be, the disciples that we know we can be as we commit ourselves to you, as we love you. And so now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Well, as we have mentioned, this is the culmination of our six weeks, six steps to discipleship, being committed to Christ, six steps to a more generous life. And uh, I have enjoyed the, the preaching and um, focusing on prayer and Bible reading and worship. And Denny did a good job in talking about witness. And then um, and that's, maybe I missed, missed worship here, worship life and witness and financial giving and service. It's had integrity to it. A lot of um, you know, programs, stewardship programs, only focus on financial giving, but this has had uh, a, a broader scope to it and uh, really calling us to be disciples. Uh, the financial giving part is a part of that, but it's, it's just one part of that. And, and I have really appreciated that, um, uh, that focus and that balance. Um, but I have to admit, um, we haven't talked a lot about the word commitment, because that's really at the heart of this. Has, have we changed any? You know, have we, are we making a greater commitment in being disciples and living the Christian life? You know, have I, has our prayer life changed in any way? Are we spending any more time in prayer? Has the quality of our prayer life changed? You know, we, maybe we tried to read the Bible seven minutes a day, uh, but gave up on it. You know? And worship, well, you know, I attend when I can, but I don't know if I really am prepared to connect with God and, and witness. Do I really have to talk about my faith? You know, is that, is that something that I really just don't want to do? Financial giving, well, I'll give, what, I'll give what I gave last year. Um, service, well, don't ask too much of it. What about commitment? Are we committing ourselves to, to a little more, to that growing one step, not just in our giving, but in our living? Are we more committed to Christ now than we were six weeks, weeks ago? i got to think about this word commitment. What does it mean? What's at the heart of it? When I think about it, and what is the motivation for doing these things, for committing to, to Christ, it really comes down to what Jesus is being asked. It's the same question, really. Uh, a teacher of the law, an expert in Jewish law, was, he was sent to try to test Jesus and to ask him, what is, what is it that we are to commit ourselves to? What's greatest? What's the, the most important thing that there is? What's the greatest commandment, he says? That's the question to Jesus. And Jesus sort of summarizes it with one word. Love. Love. Now, as soon as I say love, we have to talk about that and qualify that because in our society particularly, um, love gets sentimentalized. You know, we think of love songs and movies and books and novels and, and stories and TV programs that I think talk about love, or but the love that they're presenting is more about feeling and um, sentiment. Now, feeling and sentiment is certainly a part of love, but there's a deeper quality to love that Jesus is getting at. You know, sometimes you'll see a young couple and they're holding hands and they're leaning into each other, and you think, oh, there's a, a young couple in love. But I have to say that as I get older, what impresses me more are couples who have been married 40, 50, 60 years, and they're holding hands, and not just for stability, you know. <laughs> you can tell. They're in love. 
And that love is deeper than it's ever been. Because they've been through things. Things that life brings. Think about my parents. When they got married, my dad was just out of the Navy, and my mom, they were young, and they were poor. They struggled. And just like many, many of you, started a family and worked hard. And but things happen in life, don't they? Have you ever lost a job, been fired from a job? What that does to you and the relationship? What, you know? There was a, an upper room devotion um, maybe a couple months back of a man, he, he and his wife had just purchased a new home. And they had two sons in college and he lost his job. And he talks about how in the months that transpired before he was able to find another job, just how he prayed and called upon God and, and actually grew deeper in his faith. He and, and his wife and sons and praying and trusting God and, and God provided a good job. But you've been through things that deepen that love for each other diagnosis of, of cancer or some disease, a, a death in the family. My heart goes out to these families whose daughters have been abducted and killed. It just breaks our hearts. Nothing worse for a parent than to lose a child. When we go through things together over the years, our love deepens. And that's really what we're talking about. Commitment to each other and love and Jesus is saying, this is what I'm talking about in terms of loving God. But the thing is, and there's a twist here, that it's not so much about us loving God as it is about God loving us. And I'd like to just read one passage from 1 John, the epistle of John, chapter 4, and around verse 10. Or nine, he says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his only son into the world that we might love through him. And then verse 10, he says, this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So God first loved us. And as I was trying to, to say to the, to the children, our response is then to love God in return. God first loved us. You know, I was thinking about how we in the church, particularly those of us who have grown up in the church, active in the church, I think we have a disadvantage here because we have heard this message so much, so often, that it, it loses its meaning to us. We just too familiar with it. It's like going sightseeing in your own neighborhood, you know? Many of you live in neighborhoods where there are multi-million dollar homes, but you just drive right past them, you know? Because you're familiar with them. Maybe occasionally you'll look over and you say, oh, that's a, that's a nice house. But you just don't notice them anymore because they're familiar to you. I'm thinking about the cross. I have one on the altar, one on the wall. You know, it's so familiar to us in the message around what the cross means. So try to imagine that you just got off a plane into the U.S., and all of your life you've lived in Asia or some other country and not a Christian nation, maybe grew up Buddhist, and you somehow encounter the cross and you want to know about it. What does this cross mean? And the thing is, you don't even have to grow up in another country. Many people in our own country have no real understanding of what the cross is about. But think about what it means to us. How God loved us so much that he came to be one of us. That God became human to know what we know, to feel what we feel. And Jesus began to call people into the kingdom. Turn away from the things that have kept you from God and come into this kingdom. Follow me, he said to those fishermen. Follow me. And 
that ultimate act of love at the end of Jesus' public ministry, and I have to admit, I don't really understand it. Theologians call it the atonement, and that scripture in 1 John 4 mentions that. How Jesus, because of love, took upon himself our sin. All the things that we have done that are wrong, all of our rebellion, our disobedience, immorality, selfishness, hurtfulness, <coughs> violence, all the things that have blocked us, been a barrier between us and God, Jesus took that upon himself and died in our place. Those of you who are, are familiar with the Alpha Course know this story, and, and uh, I heard it elsewhere as well. Chuck Colson told it once, and it's about uh, a man, July 1941, and he was a prisoner in Auschwitz, um, concentration camp. And there, a prisoner had uh, escaped, and so in reprisal to punish and be an example, the Gestapo said they would pick 10 men and put them in a bunker where they would starve to death. And this was to be a, a sort of a sign, don't try to escape. And so 10 men were chosen randomly, and one was by the name of, of Maximilian Kolb, K-O-L-B-E. And as soon as his name was called, he said, oh, my poor wife, my poor children, my wife will not have a husband, my children will not have a father. And there nearby was a, a man who, by the name of Francis Gajanesko, and he was a Polish priest, stepped forward and he said, I want to take this man's place. He says, I'm not married, I don't have children, I'm a priest. I want to die in his place. And surprisingly, they accepted his offer. And so he, along with nine people, were put in this bunker where they were just simply left until they died. But his presence there changed the whole quality of their, their dying. He quoted scripture to them. He led them in prayer. They sang hymns. And he was the last to die. Forty years later, in St. Peter's, the Pope recognized Francis Gajaneste, what he had done. And his comment was that the victory that he had won, because what he did had, had spread, that the, this story had spread and affected many people, he said his victory was not unlike the victory of Christ. And the rest of his life, Maximilian Kolb told people about what Francis Gajaneste So thinking about what Jesus has done for us, Jesus didn't die just for one of us, but for all of us. And again, not just dying, but taking upon himself our sin in what is called the atonement. He was the fulfillment of that system where once a year a lamb was brought on the Day of Atonement and was slain, a lamb without blemish, to take away the sin of the world of the, the people. But it was only a foreshadowing, and it had to be repeated year after year. But when Jesus came on the scene, John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so Jesus was that final sacrifice to take away all of our sin, to remove those barriers, to remove our guilt, so that we can be free. This is his love for us. I'm afraid that we've heard this message so often that we can hear it and yawn. We can hear it and fall asleep or think about what we're going to be doing the rest of the day. If we could hear it for the first time, that God loves you. Jesus did this for you. What impact it would have on us if we could hear it that he takes away our sin and loves us so much. So then, our response back can be that we love him. Jesus says, love the Lord your God. That's the most important thing. That's the greatest commitment. That's the greatest commandment. 
Love God with your whole being, your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you say, well, wait a minute. There's other things I love. I love my spouse. I love my children. I love my grandchildren. I love my home. I love my country, where I live, things I do. Jesus isn't saying don't love those. He's saying bring your love for God into all of those things, into every relationship, into every conversation, into all that you do, your work, school life. With Jesus as Lord of your life, it changes how you live your life so that your faith isn't just something for Sunday, but for every day. And Jesus said it also then affects how you care for others. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love others as you love yourself. Last week when we talked about service, and in fact, the title of my sermon today is Risky Love. Anytime you love, there's a risk. Anytime you make a commitment, there's a risk involved. I wanted to tell this story. I kind of forgot it last week. And I, and I didn't ask permission to tell it. So when I see the person, I'm going to have to ask forgiveness for telling it. <laughs> but uh, Kristen Bartell, Kristen's not here, is she? Well, good. <laughs> Kristen has uh, bought a, a home and moved into a, her new home and she and Liam uh, were there and they had only been there just a little while and I think they were up in Liam's bedroom and when they built the house they had put the lock uh, on the wrong side of the door of Liam's bedroom. The push button lock was on the outside and somehow the button got pushed and the door was closed and Kristen and Liam were locked in the bedroom phone was downstairs and they were able to open a window but it was second story so too far to, to drop down so all she had to do was I mean her only resort was to call out for help and it, I'm, I'm sure it wasn't humorous at the time but I can just imagine you know I'm new in the neighborhood help <laughs> <laughs> I'm locked in the bedroom and a woman who was a neighbor responded and came up and, and Kristen said, well, you could come in the house if you would, just come in and unlock the door. The woman wouldn't do it. She wouldn't take the risk. Now, she called the sheriff, and 45 minutes later, a deputy showed up, and the deputy came in and unlocked the door. But my point is, we're a lot like that woman. We don't want to take a risk. Let somebody else do it. And maybe in your mind you can understand why. But still, we're called to take a risk. To love others. To take that commitment out beyond of what we've been doing and who we are. And when we do, there's such reward. There's such satisfaction in life, knowing that we make a difference in the lives of others through service, through giving, through sharing our worship and witness with others. This relationship with God that comes from prayer and, and getting to know God through scripture and worship, then spills out to others. But it takes a risk, a commitment. So the question, this is kind of the question the choir was asking in their song. Are we going to be faithful to it? Can we do it? Will we do it? Will we make that commitment to Christ? Love. Love the Lord your God. Love others as yourself. Experience the love of God who loves you first. Pray with me, if you would, please. Thank you, God, for your love for us in Christ. Thank you for the cross. Help us never to take it for granted. And now, as we, as we give back to you, and commit ourselves to you and in the year to come, we want to make it a greater commitment, stepping out in faith, in our giving, in our serving, in our witness, Help us to love you more as we love others. 
Through Christ we pray. Amen. After we sing our closing hymn, I'm going to offer the prayer over the commitment cards. And uh, in our benediction and closing, I'll include the, uh, the blessing. And please come back to enjoy the meal and fellowship around the table. And again, if you are here as a guest today, be, be our guest. There's plenty of food, and it's wonderful, it's good, and there's good fellowship. We'd love to, to talk to you and get to know you around the table. So if you're here for the first time or if you're a visitor, please be our guest today. We, we want that to happen. I'm glad that uh, you're all here uh, to be a part of this. The Gift of Love is our song. It's number 408 in the hymnal. Let's stand as we sing it. The Gift of Love. Gracious God, we celebrate your love, saying thank you for all that we have. We thank you for Bethlehem Church, a church that prays, a church that loves, a church that cares, a church in mission, a church growing. And thank you that we can be a part of this and support it through our giving. And so for these commitments that we make to you, we dedicate them to you, Lord asking that you help us to be faithful in our giving and look for ways in which we can give even beyond what we say. We love you. We thank you. We look forward to fellowship around the table and for the food that we have to eat. Bless that food to our bodies and us to your service, and we thank you. Now may God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit go with us now and forever.